Moscow Television tonight. От Совета Министров СССР. На Чернобыльской атомной электростанции произошла авария. Поврежден один из атомных реакторов. For the first time ever, the Soviet Union admits it has had a nuclear accident, and it's clearly a major one. It's almost certainly the uh, most severe accident that has ever taken place in uh, the short history of civilian nuclear power. Good evening, I'm Ted Koppel, and this is Nightline. It seems virtually certain that what the Soviets have experienced is a nuclear meltdown. How serious and far-reaching would the effects be? We'll talk with Dr. James McKenzie, nuclear physicist for the Union of Concerned Scientists, and with Dr. Marvin Dickerson, who is tracking radioactivity in the atmosphere for the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. This is ABC News Nightline, reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. There is some information coming from the Soviet Union tonight, some but not much. United Press International in Moscow reached some residents of Kiev by phone. Kiev is roughly 60 miles from the site of today's nuclear accident. According to these reports, all bus service in the city of Kiev has been stopped so that the buses can be used to evacuate those in the disaster area. From the Hungarian capital of Budapest, there are reports of many injuries at the site of the accident. And from Montgomery, Alabama, where the Environmental Protection Agency has its radiation alert network, there is word that radiation from the Soviet accident could, within a week or so, make its way over the North Polar region to the western United States. The effect of such radiation, if it reaches the United States, would almost certainly be very minor indeed. We will talk about that later. But first, an update on what we know. Here's Nightline correspondent Jed Duval. In the Soviet Union, there is rarely bad news. Airplane crashes are not ordinarily reported. Many of the Western world scientists are convinced that in 1957 or 58, a large nuclear accident occurred in the Ural Mountains, some 800 miles east of Moscow, in the vicinity of Kishtim. Radioactive contamination covered 40 to 400 square miles. The names of some 30 villages have since disappeared from Soviet maps. Evidence of a disaster of some sort is clear, but Soviet authorities have never acknowledged a problem. So it was extraordinary that Soviet TV news did report a big accident today. It came deep in the newscast, almost buried, after production reports, after lists of worker awards, and this is what it said. An accident has occurred at the Chernobyl atomic power plant as one of the atomic reactors was damaged. Measures are being undertaken to eliminate the consequences of the accident. Aid is being given to those affected. A government commission has been set up. Four ambiguous sentences that contain nothing about injuries or deaths. But that's four more sentences than the Soviets usually provide. So, Western experts conclude, it must be very bad indeed. The first the world knew of the accident was when Scandinavians noticed radiation in the air over the weekend just past. Not enough to hurt anyone, but enough to frighten. I would speculate that it was very serious. And, and the reason for that is that they've observed radiation levels 10 times normal from Finland all the way down to Stockholm. Something very big indeed. Many Western scientists have said this evening it could have been a complete oh, meltdown. Uh, the TMI accident was nothing compared with this. Uh, the TMI accident uh, noted uh, high expo moderate exposures, really, like an X-ray within a mile or so of the plant. That was seven years ago this spring, and nobody was killed, and very little radiation got out, despite all the alarm, because at Three Mile Island and all other American nuclear power plants, there's a containment building, a short, squat silo made of very thick concrete with an awful lot of steel in it, an expensive addition to the plant, which is supposed to contain radiation if anything goes wrong. Most Soviet nuclear power plants do not have such containment structures. Are they necessary? This is what can happen, and apparently has happened in Russia, as described by correspondent Marshall Frady in an ABC News close-up last summer. The worst that can happen involves a loss of cooling water around the fuel rods. Even if the plant operation is immediately shut down, the uncovered fuel rods would reach an extraordinary heat. 
soon melting themselves right through the reactor vessel, the beginning of a total meltdown. Ultra-hot radioactive material would drop to the floor of the chamber, burn through deep into the earth, possibly releasing enormous amounts of radiation. Radiation from any source can attack the thyroid, the skin, the lungs, the spleen, the liver, the kidneys, the bone, the muscle, the reproductive organs. Its effects, cancers, genetic mutations. Very little radiation has been detected in Finland, Sweden, Denmark. It's a lot more than normal and alarming, but still not harmful to humans. However, close to the Soviet plant, it must be another story. The chief nuclear scientist for the Electric Power Research Institute in Palo Alto, California said tonight, if the radioactivity is a few millirems 700 miles away, I'd hate to be within 10 miles of the site. What about the people who live near that plant? Chances are, whatever they know, it's by word of mouth only. Indeed, it is Budapest Radio in Hungary, which tonight reports injuries in Russia and says that the radiation leak occurred next to a reservoir which serves the large Soviet city of Kiev. They have not had uh, the heavy regulation, the media pressure, the legal pressures that uh, our, our nuclear industry has faced. Uh, add all that up and you have to ask yourself, uh, can they be watching safety as closely as our industry has been forced to, or is it normal human instinct to cut corners? The Soviets might well have said nothing about this accident had not the wind blown the fallout over their neighbors in Scandinavia. Did some of the radioactivity go also to East Bloc nations? It is difficult to imagine a southeasterly wind from Kiev near the accident drifting toward Denmark and not touching Poland, Czechoslovakia, East Germany, perhaps Hungary, countries that are several hundred miles closer to the trouble than Scandinavia. But there's very little official word from any of those nations. For the moment, it may be safe to say that Western Europeans, Americans, and the world in general have a better sense of all this than the Russian public. Jed Duval for Nightline. Later on, we'll be talking with two experts on nuclear power. But first, when we return, the impact on the Soviet Union. We'll be joined by Soviet affairs expert Dmitry Symes of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and by Marshall Goldman of the Russian Research Center at Harvard University, who has written books on Soviet energy and pollution problems. Joining us live now in our Washington bureau is Dmitry Symes, senior associate with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and an expert on the Soviet Union and Marshall Goldman, Professor of Economics at Wellesley College and Associate Director of Harvard University's Russian Research Center. Gentlemen, we are going to have to infer from your knowledge, to a large extent, what has happened there this evening. And Professor Goldman, I wonder if you would help me just in terms of geography. We have a map, in fact, that you brought in. We've done a little bit of colorizing to that map, but let's take a look at it. There at the bottom we see Kiev. Up in the, at the top of your screen, you can see the little nuclear symbol. That is the location of the, uh, the nuclear plant. And what, Professor Goldman, is that body of water? Well, my assumption is that it's the reservoir for the water supply of Kiev. This is the way the Russians usually do things. They upstream of the major city, as in Moscow, uh, they will use the water supply. They'll dam it up. And it, it's possible, therefore, that uh, this r reservoir has been contaminated because it's really an enlarged Dnieper River. Uh, joined by the Pripet River, and that's where the nuclear facility is located. And so it's possible that it's not just the other cities up north where the uh, air cloud is moving, but, but also the water supply of Kiev that's been affected. Now, if it is, and we've been told that it is, roughly 60 miles from Kiev to the, uh, to the nuclear plant, then it would be, what, 5, 10, 15 miles from the plant to that water supply? Or, or the likelihood is the plant is located right on the river, uh, and so it, it, it's, it's a question that could be five miles, it could be less. Uh, now it's, it's partly speculation, but my assumption is that it's very good speculation. Now, uh, tell me a little something about the, the Soviet dependence on nuclear energy. How, how dependent have they become over the well, years? Well, it now constitutes about eight to nine percent of their total electric supply. Their goal is to make it much more because their uh, energy supplies, coal, oil, have been depleted in the western part of the country and so they've instituted a regulation basically which says that any new electric utility built 
uh, in the western part of the Soviet Union will be nuclear energy. And they build them in large uh, uh, clusters. There are, there are actually four reactors operating at this particular facility. Uh, the first one was built in, seven, in 77. Uh, and the earlier ones did not have a containment vessel, as your reporter indicated earlier. Uh, so they, they count on this, and this is really going to put a crimp in their efforts to uh, bring about more nuclear energy. Mr. Symes, what can you tell us? Uh, we, we have kind of jumped to certain conclusions about Mr. Gorbachev and about the Soviet Union under Gorbachev. Is it likely that we are going to learn any more of what has happened? In other words, more than they have to tell us? Ted, first of all, they obviously will have to tell something. When they announce major disasters in the Soviet Union on evening news, on national TV, they always will tell, as they told us tonight, that there would be national commission of inquiry and they would publicly report findings of this commission. But they would tell very little about casualties. They would tell very little about real reasons for the disaster. They would provide a very brief summary and usually the summary would be rather misleading. Now, Kiev is a city of more than two million people. Somehow, even in the Soviet Union, something is going to get out, isn't it? Oh, uh, Ted, there will be many, many rumors, and uh, there will be so many rumors, so much different gossip, that it will be very difficult to determine what has really happened. But I think you asked a very good question. Here we have a new Soviet leader who was so much praised for openness, and they made this announcement only when they absolutely had to, when the Scandinavians detected this reaction, their instinct was to wait as much as possible and not to reveal the truth to their own population. I think this is a rather revealing and sad story. All right, gentlemen, let's take a look now at another map that we have, a somewhat broader map, and if you would just look at your monitors, you will see there again is that nuclear symbol just uh, uh, at 11 o'clock above Kiev, and then over there to the left, Poland, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and, and up to Finland. Does it seem reasonable to assume that that nuclear cloud, uh, that radioactive cloud, made its way across Eastern Europe? And if so, are we likely to hear anything more, Marshal Goldman, from Eastern Europe than we're hearing from the Soviet Union? I think we're going to hear a lot more from Eastern Europe because they've been very much concerned about these things. We're also going to hear from some of the other major cities inside the Soviet Union, Minsk, uh, the Estonian uh, Republic, the Latvian Republic. There are some very major cities in that area. Uh, and, you know, just like uh, in the United States, when we had Three Mile Island, uh, Jim McKenzie said earlier that it was, didn't compare at all in its magnitude to what's happened uh, recently in the Soviet Union. And I think the Soviets are going to be very frightened about it as a result. They've been very cavalier about uh, energy in the past and how they've treated their safety precautions, and now it's going to come down on them. All right, gentlemen, we want to hear from some of our scientific experts who are with us. And when we come back, we will focus on the potential effects of the accident with Dr. James McKenzie, in charge of nuclear power research for the Union of Concerned Scientists, and with Dr. Marvin Dickerson of Lawrence Livermore Laboratories, who is tracking nuclear fallout from the accident. With us now live in our Washington bureau, Dr. James McKenzie, a nuclear physicist who was formerly with the President's Council on Environmental Quality and is now a senior staff scientist for the Union of Concerned Scientists, a public interest research organization. And Dr. Marvin Dickerson, who joins us live from the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California, one of two nuclear weapons plants in the United States. Dr. Dickerson is project director of a group that tracks radioactivity in the atmosphere and is closely monitoring conditions in and around the Soviet Union. What so far? Anything? Well, uh, at the moment, uh, we have been collecting the weather, uh, the weather data, the weather pattern data, for that part of the world over the past uh, four to five days. And that's where we've been concentrating our efforts thus far, so that we can begin to build a case on the transport of the material uh, out of the Soviet Union and into the, uh, into the Scandinavian area. How important is that weather data to you? And more importantly, how important is it to us here in the United States? In other words, do you share the, the, uh, the point made by that man from the EPA down in Montgomery, Alabama, that theoretically this could wind its way to the United States eventually? Uh, theoretically, that would certainly be a possibility. However, from what I <clears throat> understand, from what I've heard in the media about the, uh, about the levels of the activity, even though they should uh, enter the U.S., they would be at extremely low values. So nothing to worry about? Uh, I would not, no. All right, Dr. McKenzie, let's backtrack a little now to the Soviet Union. 
Do you share the what seems to be the widely held belief that this was, in fact, either a partial or a total meltdown? It would seem that way, Ted. Um, they have detected, according to the people that I've spoken with, uh, fission products in Scandinavia, specifically in Sweden, both iodine and cesium. And these are part of the fuel and can only get transported out if the fuel were to melt. So it looks as though there was uh, an accident that certainly led to the release of these fission products. And uh, although <clears throat> the cartoon that was shown earlier is of a U.S. reactor, and it's a little bit different in the Soviet Union, the effect is the same, which is that a large amount of radioactivity apparently uh, got loose and got transported uh, at least 700 miles to, uh, to Sweden and up to Finland. All right. Now, if the map that we've shown you is, is accurate within 5 or 10 miles in any direction, and indeed that nuclear plant is right on what appears to be the water supply for the city of Kiev, how important would that be? How drastic would that be for the citizens of Kiev? Well, a lot depends on how the accident evolved, and we just don't know. But certainly, there's a lot of radioactive material that could uh, get into waterways like that. And if they did, it would take some time to set up any kind of a treatment plant to try and remove them. So if the water is contaminated, then I think uh, there's a real uh, potential health risk to people drinking it. Dr. McKenzie, we were just looking at that map of Eastern Europe and going up into Scandinavia. Mm -hmm. uh, how, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this, at which point does it cease to be dangerous? Well, from the news reports that I have s heard and seen and from talking with people in Stockholm this morning, I would guess that the people in, in Sweden would be getting the equivalent of an x-ray or two over the course of this accident. Now, what, about, what about the people in Poland? Let's assume that that map of ours and that cloud of ours, I mean, the map is correct. I'm not sure about the cloud. We won't really know about that for some well, days, I guess. Obviously, the closer you get to the source, the higher the levels of radiation. And there, um, I don't know whether Dr. Dr. Dickerson is doing any back calculations, but it should be possible, uh, knowing the meteorology, to do some estimates of what the uh, exposures would be uh, closer to the plant and get a better a sense, therefore, of what kind of casualties we might expect. Uh, uh, Dr. Dickerson, is, yeah, why don't you that, pick up on that, yes, please? <clears throat> yes, that would, be, uh, that would be possible. For example, we did that during the uh, Three Mile Island accident because we had good measurements, uh, we had access to good measurements, and we were able to take our models, our numerical models, and take the measurements and uh, do, the, uh, do the calculations and estimate the source term. Uh, and that is a doable thing to do. So in other However, words, you, you are going to be able to assess what? The, the, the nature of the, of the meltdown based on the, the study of wind patterns and what you're finding, for example, in Scandinavia? Well, we, we can estimate, if we have the proper measurements, we can then go back and calculate approximately uh, the amount of material that was released. All right. uh, we, have to, we have to know something about the timing, of course. Now, the, timing, the timing is crucial in terms of the accident. Dr. McKenzie, itself. tell me something about the nature of this radioactivity on the food chain. Uh, I mean, obviously, this is in an inhabited area. Mm -hmm. uh, what's going well, to happen? We it, it have, um, at least I was told this morning, that iodine had been detected. And that's one of the most serious elements to worry about. Iodine can be absorbed directly uh, by breathing, and it can accumulate in your thyroid and cause uh, thyroid cancer in sufficient doses. And it can also. Um, uh, accumulate on grass, uh, be eaten by cows, and go into milk. So I would imagine that uh, countries, uh, Scandinavian countries, Eastern European countries, would be beginning to monitor their milk, looking for iodine. And for those countries that might be receiving direct exposures that are high, they might be considering the distribution of potassium iodide tablets to try and block the uh, iodine from getting to the thyroid. And is there any way, for example, of cleansing the water? If that is Kiev's major water supply, that would be a horrendous problem, wouldn't it? I would think so. I mean, they can remove radioactive elements by uh, chemical treatment, but I presume there is no uh, large facility, and there's a lot of water for two and a half million people. Gentlemen, let's take a break. Yeah. We will continue our discussion in just a moment. Continuing our discussion now with Dimitri Symes, what's going to be, and I hate to use the word fallout, but what's going to be the economic fallout in the Soviet Union of this? Uh, that very little, because let's face it, in the Soviet Union they don't have independent media, they don't have nightline shows, they don't have the union of consent scientists. 
they will have the government commission, the commission will present recommendations, they will build containment buildings, concrete protection structures, but as Marshall Goldman observed, they have very little choice but to move in the direction of nuclear energy. They have no other options, so the fundamental Soviet economic policy is not going to change. Marshall Goldman, uh, you and I were talking during the break, and you mentioned that uh, when we speak about Soviet openness, and everything is relative now, they've had a couple of these things before. Apparently right? there was an, a similar incident in 1981, although not as, not as serious. Uh, there was, of course, the thing that you mentioned earlier in 1958. Uh, and there, the news, the communique that was issued said uh, this is the first time such a thing has happened in the Soviet Union. And of course it's not. And it's not. I would say one other thing, by the way, Ted, there may be some international fallout in that sense that this may make the Russians more amenable to coming back to uh, the summit meeting. Uh, we've got, we're in this together, let's see what we can do, not only in terms of nuclear energy, but at nuclear arms. Dr. McKenzie, any closing thoughts? Only that uh, I think uh, it, it behooves us in this country uh, not to try and relax nuclear standards anymore under the assumption that the containments will always hold because as we see if they don't hold it can cause a very serious accident indeed. All right, Dr. Dickerson, in the last few seconds we have left, do you think this is going to have an impact on nuclear energy in this country? Because obviously opponents of nuclear energy are going to seize on this and say, aha, you see what can happen. Yeah, I, I think it's really too early to tell, Ted. Uh, uh, I think we need to make a, more of an assessment of the accident before we can, uh, you know, really say what the impact's going to be. When do you and think course, you're going to have your picture together? Uh, we're hoping within a few days we're, we're able to start to put the, uh, uh, quite a bit of the picture together. It depends on getting information, which is always a, a problem in a, in a situation like this. All right. Dr. Dickerson, Dr. McKenzie, Professor Goldman, Dimitri Symes, thank you very much indeed for joining us, gentlemen. That's our report for tonight. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night. This has been ABC News Nightline. For a transcript of tonight's broadcast, send $2 to Journal Graphics, Box 234, Ansonia Station, New York, New York, 10023. Nightline is a presentation of ABC News.